Hello, welcome to all. I'm Sandra Toes and I'm the director of the School of Information Management. Uh, we're very happy to uh, welcome you here this evening to our Information Management Public Lecture Series. I'll start by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. We are very pleased to pre present this talk today as part of our information management public lecture series. In this series, we bring leading thinkers to key topics related to the changing role of information and society. We're very happy to have Dr. Lucy Gugo speaking with us here today. Before we begin, I also just wanted to give you a few logistics. Uh, as you're listening and uh, watching this talk, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, so the questions will show up in the Q&A and you can actually vote on other people's questions to suggest which ones you really want to hear an answer to. Uh, so after the talk, we, I will then have, post the, the question and answer period, and I will be looking to see which questions are the most popular. So feel free to be uh, giving your questions as, as you move through. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Lucy Gibault is a professor of intellectual property law and the director of Law and Technology Institute at the Schulich School of Law here at Dalhousie University in Halifax. She joined the Schulich School of Law in July 2017 after spending 20 years at the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam. She studied civil law at the University de Montréal and received in 2002, her doctorate from the University of Amsterdam. Lucy is specialized in international and comparative intellectual property law. Over the years, she has carried out research in numerous European, Canadian, and international organizations. Her general research interests revolve around the critical and normative analysis of the copyright system primarily looking at the impact of technology change on the balance of interest between rights owners and users. She has countless publications on topics related to copyright and related rights in the information society, open content licensing, collective rights management, limitations and exceptions in copyrights, authors contract law. Please watch for details for our next lecture, which I'll talk about after today's talk. And today's talk is, of course, on copyright law and text and data mining. Does the Canadian Copyright Act need to be amended? Over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you for the very, very nice welcome. And I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. Um, thank you to all for joining into this lecture. Um, the topic today is copyright law and text and data mining. It's, it's been an issue that's been on the table for a number of years, at least uh, certainly before I left Amsterdam uh, in 2017. The issue of text and data mining was a growing issue because text and data mining, as you may realize, uh, is a, a growing uh, method of doing research. And this is thanks to the um, increased capacity for uh, computational analysis and the increased digitization of all texts. You know, we, we used to have corpus of texts that were all uh, uh, on paper and uh, with the digitization of all the, the archives, now we have access to a wealth of information out there and with computer, we can search the, the texts in a very new way which we could not before. And well, there are copyright issues that do arise. So um, today uh, I will, so hopefully, ah, so today's uh, presentation is uh, divided in the uh, topic, uh, sorry, uh, following uh, themes. Uh, first, uh, a, a short description about, uh, you know, the use of text mining as a uh, modern research tool. Then text mining from a copyright lens. 
then exploring what Canadian copyright law says about uh, text and data mining. Um, well, is there any applicable exception? Does the fair dealing exception um, apply? And uh, we will see that there, there might be a way forward uh, on the basis of all this. So let me continue. Um, I, I chose rather at random uh, two examples to, to present to you this afternoon. Um, both examples are from uh, Professor Andrew Piper, who is a professor at McGill University, and he does a lot of research using texts and um, using mining as texts. And you see this uh, first example that I uh, present you is uh, he did research in a collection of 1,211 novels published between 2000 and 2015 where he, he looked at uh, what are the types of books that are more likely to obtain prizes and what does that say about uh, culture and uh, literature. And so he did not only look at the metadata, but he certainly looked at all the novels. And if you look at the research, I think it's a very interesting publication, you will see that he classified uh, the different um, works that he looked at um, into different categories. And uh, through text mining, uh, he questioned or, or he queried the, the books in, in searching for topics and words and uh, trying to decipher or to predict or to analyze uh, which types of books uh, or novels would be most likely to receive prices. So you will see for me, from my perspective, what's interesting here is uh, the number of novels that he uh, chose to query and also the, the very recent uh, dates that he used. And he used uh, novels published between 2000 and 2015. You can certainly understand that these are all copyright protected works. None of them are yet in the public domain. So this is a first example of true application of text mining. Another example is also from Professor Piper. Uh, he did research um, on metadata on institutional affiliation for 5,000 and more academic articles published in four prestige journals within the humanities. And he was looking to see, you know, who uh, who are the authors uh, with, from, coming from which uh, uh, institutions and, uh, you know, looking at uh, different data to, to see indeed, uh, as the title of his publication indicates, what's the power and patronage and um, behind all these publications. So for me also what's important or interesting from a copyright perspective is that he queried again thousands of articles published in uh, copyright protected journals and the articles themselves are uh, copyright protected. And uh, mo I mean, all of these uh, are uh, presumably all still uh, protected by copyright. So where does that uh, leave us? So this, these are two examples of text mining. There are countless other examples of text mining uh, where you can say that text mining is, is really used uh, to generate new knowledge on the basis of existing knowledge. And uh, considering the fact that scholarly publishing and all types of publishing online is so um, important in terms of numbers of publications per year, uh, you can say that at least if there's not a human person to read every single article, well, at least through text and, and data mining, you can say that at least machine learning and machine reading does happen and that the knowledge included in all those publications does um, generate new knowledge through this uh, use of uh, text mining uh, methods. So, you know, from this is the these are the common steps that are uh, taken and I'm not a text miner myself, but the study of the copyright issues uh, involved in text mining have revealed to me that there are typical steps that are taken when uh, a, a researcher 
engages in text mining. And so first of all, you, you will crawl and scrape text to find out, you know, uh, what uh, data set you need. Uh, and then you, you will create your own data set. And so if we relate to the two first examples, the first data set was the thousand and some uh, novels that were used, or in the second uh, example were the 5,000 and plus articles. So those are the two um, targeted data sets. And then you will cre query the two sets and you will analyze and evaluate the results and you will publish the results. So what does that mean in practice? That means that you make several reproductions to be able to, to crawl and scrape and, and produce a target database, you also presumably will make a reproduction of all those works to analyze and evaluate the results. So you will also presumably store all those uh, reproductions somewhere safe so that you are able to verify your results and, um, and offer uh, uh, support when you publish your article. Um, so these are the different steps that are taken in text and data mining. So if you consider in the two examples that I showed you that all the works involved are still copyright protected, and you may remind um, that copyright protection lasts for the life of the author plus that, uh, well, at least 50 years and in Europe and the United States, 70 years after the death of the author, copyright protection is very long. So it's um, almost by definition that all the articles or the novels that are involved in the two examples uh, involved are still copyright protected. So there are definite uh, copyright dimension to the use of text mining as a research method. What's the current practice. So research also shows that um, publishers have adopted a vast array of different approaches to text mining. Some authorize it, some prohibit it, and some uh, make it conditional to certain um, use of uh, an API or other conditions. So the first example that I'm showing you is a, a legal publisher, Tom, Thomson Reuters. Uh, Thomson Reuters uh, prohibits mining, as you will see on the slide, unless they uh, have given prior uh, authorization. So uh, this is taken from their terms and conditions, the version two. And it's, it does say, unless previously authorized by uh, Thomson Reuters, you must not uh, run or install any computer software or hardware on your or products, services, or network. Use any technology to automatically download, mine, scrape, or index our data, or to automatically connect, whether through APIs or otherwise, our data to other data, software, services, or networks. So any anyone who wants to use articles uh, contained in the databases of Thomson Reuters is not allowed to scrape or mine the database without their prior authorization. So it's a prohibition uh, unless you, you ask permission. Another example is Elsevier. Uh, so I found the contract uh, or the terms and conditions between Elsevier and Canadian Research Knowledge Network and um, clause 3.9 uh, deals with text and data mining. So Elsevier is a bit more generous than Thomson Reuters. Elsevier says each member, meaning the members of the uh, Canadian Research Knowledge Network, each member may download and may make a, a copy of the whole or any parts of the licensed material for purposes of internal comp computational analysis, including text and data mining via an API for the purpose of research for a non-commercial purpose. And they also have listed a number of conditions um, that I didn't reproduce on the slide, but including uh, conditions on the obligation to give attribution, uh, conditions on how long and where uh, a researcher or an institution can store 
the the data or the the, the works that are being mined and uh, other conditions um, uh, respecting the, the the publication of results. So um, the Elsevier clause gives permission, but it's a very conditional permission because it it First of all, it limits the way that uh, text and data mining can happen right? in the in the sense that it li limits it to the use of an API. It limits the character of the research that is allowed to happen without permission um, to only non-commercial purpose. And it also um, puts a number of conditions on the text and data mining activity itself. So a third example is uh, the University of Chicago Press. Uh, I use this example because um, it's one of the publications that were used by Professor Andrew Piper in his um, second uh, publication. Remember the 5,000 and plus uh, articles that he uh, mined to um, investigate uh, where the affiliations and the power and patronage happen in scholarly writing. So one of the four publications that he mined was published by the University of Chicago Press journals. And in, in that agreement, you see at section or clause uh, 3.1.7 uh, relates to text and data mining. And there, uh, this is a bit more uh, generous to the user. It, it is limited to authorized users may use the content to perform and engage in text and mining for academic research, scholarship, or other educational purposes. Um, and make, they make the results available to others so long as the purpose is not to create a product for use by third parties that would substitute for a subscription. Uh, and um, so, and the rest of the of the clause um, is, you know, subject to approval from the press for other types of use, which uh, shall not be unreasonably upheld. So you see from these three examples of clauses in contracts that um, text and data mining is uh, well is an activity that is really conditional on the goodwill of the publishers for a great extent. And, um, and the question arise, you know, um, what's the basis of this? And is, is there an exception on copyright law that would allow, you know, uh, text and mining to, to take place perhaps without the permission of the, of the publisher? So what does copyright protection say? Copyright protects really expressions of ideas and not ideas themselves. This is the main principle in copyright law that um, ideas are not protected and therefore also data, raw data is not protected. So uh, in copyright law, any work that shows sufficient skill and judgment will receive protection. So uh, this will certainly include novels and articles uh, more elaborate metadata. So, uh, you know, for information management, you're, you're, uh, you're certainly used to dealing with metadata. Now, the, the, the most basic metadata, you know, dates, names of authors, names of publishers will not be protected by, meta, uh, by copyright. However, if you have a, a description of an object, a description of a book, um, it will presumably uh, be the um, the fruit of the author's uh, uh, skill and judgment. So the a more elaborate type of metadata or field that contains a description, for example, will presumably be copyright protected. And uh, just like any film or music or software or video game. So uh, copyright protects any type of work as long as there's skill in judgment and the level of uh, skill in judgment, which other countries refer to as originality in Canada is pretty low. It's not the lowest, but it's pretty low. So you can think that copyright applies to most types of works or, or information out there. What kind of uh, rights do uh, authors get? Well, the right to publish the work or any substantial part thereof, 
the right to reproduce the work or any substantial part thereof um, in any material form. And that's the, you know, the right of reproduction is really uh, one of the broadest rights um, possible for an author. And it is recognized as um, applying also to software and to, to any type of digitized, you know, any digitization of a work will be a, a, a a reproduction in the sense of copyright. So, um, making the reproduction, as I as I showed you, as part of the steps in text mining, is certainly um, considered in in most countries in the world uh, as a, an act of reproduction um, for the purpose of copyright. You could you could dispute that, you know, in in principle or in theory. It, it could be argued that there's little sense in in covering um, types of reproduction that don't lead, you know, to the reading or to the um, experiencing of the work in a way that that humans do. You know, a pure mechanical reproduction. You could perhaps argue that it should not be covered by copyright. But the fact is that I think internationally, uh, case law and legislators have, and also in Canada, it, it's usually recognized that, you know, the right of reproduction is just so broad that it does also include all these uh, preliminary steps in, in text mining. The third right that's important in this context is the right to communicate to the public by telecommunication, which uh, is relevant when you want to publish the results of your research because um, reproduction is one thing, but you also want to be able to publish the results of your research, and that would be an act of communication to the public uh, by telecommunication uh, if it takes place online um, or, uh, yeah, um, mainly online. So you see what is protected, you see what the rights are uh, granted under the Copyright Act. Now, the, the following question is, so would the Copyright Act contain any exception that might be relevant and allow uh, text mining to take place without the prior authorization of the rights owner? And actually, there's only one exception in the Copyright Act that um, might relate indirectly perhaps to acts of the, uh, text mining and that would be section 30.71 of the uh, copyright act and that's uh, the exception for temporary reproductions so the copyright act states that it is not an infringement of copyright to make a reproduction of a work or other subject matter if the reproduction forms an essential part of the technological pr process if the reproduction's only purpose is to facilitate the use that is not an infringement of copyright and see if the reproduction exists only for the duration of the technological process. Now, this type of temporary reproduction normally aims at caching and browsing online or, or acts of very incidental and um, ephemeral uh, reproductions. So, the preparatory reproductions made in the context of text mining may not be ephemeral enough or incidental enough to qualify for the application of this copyright exception. Um, I, I arguably the reproductions made in the context of text mining would not be an, ex, uh, an essential part of a technological process as meant here. Uh, for example, uh, comparing to browsing or caching um, online or um, and the reproductions made for text mining uh, would have a longer duration in principle than, than just the duration of the technological process. So there are many reasons why I find that this might be the close, the most closely related exception to acts of text and data mining, but are still not uh, close enough to valid to serve as the valid basis for the ex uh, exercise of text mining activities without uh, the 
authorization of rights owner. So if there's no express exception in the Copyright Act, perhaps fair dealing might be um, a defense to a copyright infringement claim. So uh, here, um, fair dealing in a nutshell, uh, fair dealing is, is what we, we know in Canada um, uh, as one of the most common uh, defense to copyright infringement claim. In the United States, they, they know the concept of fair use but Canada, we refer to fair dealing. Fair dealing is codified at section 29, 29.1 and 29.2 of the Copyright Act, and it entails two steps. First, a court will ask whether the dealing is done for one of the enumerated purposes in the Act. And the Act, well, as, as you see on the slide, will refer to either research, private study, education, parody or satire, and that's section 29. Criticism or review is uh, covered by 29.1 and news reporting will be covered by 29.2. Now, all three uh, may have uh, a relation to text mining because I know that um, uh, journalists nowadays also uh, do investigative reporting and investigative research uh, using text mining technology. So perhaps the criticism or review or the news reporting uh, fair dealing ex uh, defenses might be relevant for journalists. Um, the, the fair dealing for research purposes would also be certainly relevant in the uh, higher education research uh, context. So the first step is to determine whether the dealing falls within one of the purposes enumerated in the act. The second step, is to determine whether the dealing is fair. Now, how do you determine whether <laughs> a dealing is fair? Now, the courts in the decades and, and um, century of, of uh, developing the doctrine of fair dealing have, have crystallized six factors that you see here on the slide. Um, First, you look at the purpose of the dealing. So the, the theoretical purpose is step one. It needs to fall within the scope of one of those uh, enumerated purposes. But then you look more uh, objectively at the purpose of that dealing in the, in the context of that use. So text mining for research purposes, well, um, I would suggest that in the first example where um, uh, Professor Piper used or, or uh, reproduced or text mined uh, 1,200 novels was indeed for researching, uh, you know, which novels or which works are more likely to receive a prize. Uh, not surprisingly, you will say, you will hear that romance was at the bottom of the list, that the uh, at the top of the list was um, works um, that, are, <laughs> that are called bestsellers. Uh, anyway, the, the purpose there would be met in an objective fashion. The next uh, uh, factor is to examine the character of the dealing. And this is, you know, how many copies do you make? How many copies of how many works do you make? Um, do you make them available or not? Or so, and this is where, in my opinion, um, text mining may have the diffi uh, some difficulty. Um, the character of the dealing may be deemed too broad to qualify as fair under the fair dealing analysis. Um, the amount of the dealing may also be too much. So if you reproduce 1,200 novels to carry out your research, is that, you know, you reproduce the entire work, an entire work of 1,211 novels. So that may also uh, disqualify the activity of text mining from the, perp you know, in the eyes of the fair dealing analysis. The next factor is the exact, ex sorry, existence of any alternatives to the dealing. There, you could hardly 
say that the, there is an alternative to the dealing. You know, if you want to to uh, examine and analyze uh, a body of works, well, you need those works to be able to analyze them. So there probably is no alternative in this case. The na nature of the work um, may also not be very relevant here. Um, this factor usually asks, you know, are, are these works that are being reproduced by the user, are these works that should or should not be further dis disseminated? I think in the two examples that I gave at the beginning, you can you can well say that, you know, the nature of those works uh, make that they should be able to be disseminated and used. So that should not play a role here. And the last factor is the effect of the dealing on the work. And I think that also text mining activities rarely have any impact on the in, in, uh, commercial uh, uh, exploitation or commercialization of the individual works in, in those uh, databases. So basically, uh, Text mining could probably, perhaps, uh, for research purposes, um, qualify as a fair dealing. It, it's a, uh, of course, it's a case by case analysis. Uh, the biggest um, lessons that we got uh, regarding fair dealing are from the case that I mentioned on the slide, the CCH Canadian versus Lost Society of Upper Canada case. And in this case, um, the the court uh, interestingly related the the analysis of the fair dealing factors to to the examination of the copyrights uh, public interest goals. And this is this is interesting because it really sets the fair dealing analysis in the general context of the copyright. What does copyright law aim to achieve? Well, it aims to achieve uh, increased public access and dissemination to works in a balanced way between uh, protecting the interests of authors, but also the court and CCH uh, declared that fair dealing and other exceptions on copyright are users' rights. So you may have heard this before, uh, but this is very unique to Canada, where Canadian Supreme Court has declared that uh, exceptions and fair dealing are a user's rights which puts uh, the rights of the users and the rights of the uh, authors on the same level. So the balance of, a, of analysis should consider both rights the same footing. Um, but you still need to, to apply all the factors of the fair dealing analysis and, and come to a conclusion. Um, in the particular instance of the case. And so some text mining activity may or may not uh, give um, right or I mean, uh, end up, you know, uh, qualifying as a fair dealing. Um, also, the court stressed in the CCH case and in, in subsequent cases that the perspective that needs to be used um, for a fair dealing analysis is the user's perspective. So in this case, it would be the researcher's perspective. So all that to say that, you know, there's no specific exception that applies to text and data mining and the fair dealing analysis may or may not come out in favor of the researcher. So um, another point that I want to, to mention is Remember the three examples of contracts that I showed you uh, earlier. Um, the question has not found its way to the court yet, is what is the intersection between contracts and fair dealing? Do contracts trump the fair dealing? Um, which of the two receives pre precedence? Um, and because there's no case that made its way to the courts, you know, um, we don't know yet how a court would uh, weigh a user's rights against the author's rights and uh, how a court would read a contract that excludes a fair dealing or an exception. So it's, it's still not clear what the position of, of 
uh, a user would be in the context of a contract like we've seen in the three examples uh, mentioned earlier. So it would also be dependent on a factual situation, but it's also clear um, that circumventing a uh, technological protection measure would not be um, recognized as a proper exercise of the fair dealing doctrine. So you can't just circumvent a protective uh, measure to exercise your fair dealing uh, right. So if you combine protective measures and contracts, you you do think that the users are not in a very favorable position, meaning that basically at this moment, text and data mining activities are really at the mercy of the goodwill of the publishers because so because contract may prevail because technological protection measures are likely to prevail because there's no exception in in the copyright act and that the fair dealing may not uh, provide a, a solid basis for text mining activities so this is where i ask well do we need um, a specific amendment of the Copyright Act, and in my opinion, we would, <laughs> we do. Um, it was raised in a in the 2019 um, copyright review consultations by the co Canadian government, uh, where together with other uh, Canadian copyright scholars, uh, we co-wrote. Uh, um, a submission for the consultation and we, we did indeed uh, argue that uh, we should adopt uh, a specific exception to, for text mining in the Canadian Copyright Act because, you know, scholarly journalistic research or any type of research for that matter is essential for the progress of society. It's in the public interest. This is how we understand and we create new, uh, new knowledge and uh, text mining is one of the research methods that is growing in importance and uh, the lack of clarity about the lawfulness of text mining is likely to have a chilling effect on research. Um, I, perhaps not on Professor Piper and I'm very happy about that. Um, I don't know if he did indeed uh, obtain permission from all the publishers from whom you know uh, he he searched and and mined the works, uh, but think of uh, the extreme transaction costs that are involved in trying to obtain permission, which also may be linked to the payment of royalties. So it's it's very time consuming and very complex to obtain permission, and it it does act as a chilling effect on research. And fair dealing will probably not provide a solid basis for text mining activities. Um, so I do think that a new exception would be necessary. Um, Canada uh, would follow in the footsteps of the European Commission um, in this way, because uh, the European um, Commission has adopted a directive in 2019 that it contains two provisions that allow explicitly text mining to, to take place. The UK also has a specific exception allowing text mining to happen, so has Japan. And in, Amer in the United States, uh, it is argued that fair use would be flexible enough to, to cover perhaps more than um, than the fair dealing would, but that's uh, debatable. Anyway, I do find that a, an exception would fit within the current framework of the Copyright Act because there are different uh, exceptions that do exist, for example, to allow encryption research or security research. So you could certainly add information analysis in, in among the new exceptions that are that would be um, included in the Copyright Act, and you could also, you know, doing that, specify, uh, you know, I would suggest taking a broad approach to research and not limited to non-commercial purposes, such as, um, well, the Europeans have limited to non-commercial purposes, but uh, in my opinion, uh, research is research, 
and should not be limited to uh, non-commercial research also because um, it, it is sometimes difficult to uh, to to establish the the the, the threshold the, when is uh, research commercial or not is it the institution that carries it uh, the research that, that would qualify as a commercial or is it the end uh, research product Anyway, how do you qualify commercial or not commercial? It's um, it remains to be seen. I also think that uh, any new exception should specify that um, unilateral contra contractual exclusion would be prohibited. Therefore, the, you know the uh, the publisher, for example, should not be able to just contractually. Uh, eliminate the exercise of the text mining uh, exception uh, through contracts and um, um, you know should also uh, prohibit the application of technological protections and measures that prevent uh, text mining to happen and it, an exception might also um, uh, give some contours for the storage of data and the publication of research results. Um, so I do think, and I'm not alone in this uh, line of thought, that uh, an amendment to the Copyright Act would be useful and it would certainly uh, give a more solid ground for text mining activities to take place. And that would be, in my opinion, in the uh, public interest because, you know, research is key to uh, to pro, uh, social progress and um, and text mining is is one of the methods of the future uh, thank you very much um, for listening to my presentation I, I hand it over back to you Sandra for questions thank you very much uh, Lucy, fascinating, fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, in a previous life, I used to work in uh, a special library in the financial services industry. So we were watching for decisions about CCH very closely uh, at that time. But it's very interesting to think how, how these decisions are um, evolving in, uh, you know, as we move to different forms. Um, like, uh, of course, text mining. Uh, so we have some questions here from the audience and start with uh, one uh, from uh, Colin Conrad, a fellow uh, faculty member here in SIM. Uh, this is fascinating. Given that fair dealing explicitly exempts enumerated processes for research, do you think this gives academic researchers privileges for innovation and in data mining that would not be given to the private sector. Uh, he adds, I normally think this is the opposite, giving the expectations of our research ethics boards. That's an interesting question, Colin. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not sure that the fair dealing for research really limits to, to a specific type of research. Or, it's certainly not limited to institutionalized research. Um, there's an interesting case uh, that was decided by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2012, if I remember correctly, uh, in Rogers versus SOCAN. Now, Rogers is the, the very well-known telecommunications um, provider, and the SOCAN, you may or may not know, is a collective rights management organization that um, administers the performance rights of music authors. Now, that case involved putting up um, sound snippets or sound previews on Roger's uh, website to allow customers to decide whether or not to download or to purchase the music. And so Roger's refused to pay the, the the license that SOCAN was demanding from it and they argued that from the customer's perspective downloading or listening to those snippets was an act of research and that was um, that was accepted by the Supreme Court so 
Yes, the research is not necessarily institutionalized research. It's not necessarily in the context of the university or uh, educational um, environment. But still in text and data mining, I think that text mining as a purpose for research would fit within the purpose um, factor. Uh, the more difficulty, I mean, the yeah, the difficulty that I foresee is is in the is in the breadth of the reproductions that do take place. So, and, and this is where I'm not sure whether the court would go along with with qualifying the reproduction of a of a thousand novels uh, as a fair dealing. So the purpose would be good. It's the amount and the character of the dealing where I'm not sure that it would qualify. And if you have doubts, then it's it's to me not a sound basis to establish um, a, a, a sound practice or you know to engage in an activity. I don't know if that answers uh, Colin's uh, question, but. I um, I think I we go ahead and assume that it is, and he will send us a message if it does not. Uh, a couple more questions coming in. I wonder about your thoughts on the legality of mining texts that other people have released publicly. For example, what if we mined Sci-Hub, which is clearly a violation of copyright, though in this case we did not violate the copyright of the text. What if we only counted headlines in Sci-Hub? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Thank you. That's um, an interesting question. Uh, yes, I see the. Um, it, it is a very interesting question. It, it all depends a bit on um, on how the new exception might be laid out in the act. Now, fair dealing, they will, among the six factors of the fair dealing analysis, they will most likely look at the legality of how the, the work was obtained. You know, uh, looking at the nature of the work, for example, might be where they might inquire whether uh, the work cited or the work mined was lawfully obtained and whether it's it's uh, legitimate. Um, but if you take a, if you can consider a future exception dealing with text mining, um, it would depend on how uh, on the wording of the exception. And I know that, for example, in Europe, the text mining exception really demands or requires that uh, the copies be lawfully accessed. So Sci-Hub um, would presumably not qualify as lawfully accessed works that would qualify for the application of the exception in, um, uh, in Europe. So it depends on the wording of the provision. Sandra, I give you the uh, floor again. Thank you, Lucy. OK, metadata descriptions like abstracts are usually available for viewing for free. Uh, do publishers actually care that they are technically, you know, maybe under copyright since they show them for free? So just getting at uh, the ability to mine abstracts. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think I think they do care that those abstracts are copyright protected. Uh, they invest, you know, time and money in creating those abstracts. I think the reasons why they give free access to the abstracts is, is a bit like a teaser. Uh, you need to, you know, you need to give the consumer something for them to decide whether or not to purchase the, the product that you offer. 
So in terms of scholarly publishing, the only reason or the only way that, uh, that users would discover whether the articles are relevant to them or not is through those abstracts. Without an abstract, um, I would think that articles would be even less read than they currently are. So yes, they give uh, access to the abstracts on a free basis, but um, it's certainly part of their marketing strategy to, to get a greater number of researchers. And, you know, to be fair, you can mine abstracts because they're free, but many researchers will say that abstracts are just a portion of what they need to really make a sound research um, and analysis. Many researchers would, would argue that you, you, you need the entire work to, to have, uh, you know, more reliable and, and valid research results. So relying only on abstracts or, or other, you know, descriptive metadata is just too smear, uh, too, too succinct um, to give rise to, to solid research results. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Lucy. Related to Colin's question, there are APIs that allow downloading research papers, metadata, including abstracts for text mining. Is this limited to text mining for research purposes or could it be extended to text mining for commercial purposes? Over to you, Lucy. Thank you. <laughs> um, you will, um, I think, I'm not sure. Ah, yes. Um, I think it, it depends on, on the publisher or the database that you're aiming at and the conditions. So generally speaking, I would say that the API, um, it, it really depends, but uh, it could be that the API is only available to authorized user. And who, who qualifies as an authorized user might be a researcher who works at an affiliated institution that has a subscription to the database, right? So in, in that context, that would eliminate anyone who, who doesn't have a license to access those works. And presumably, you know, just companies may not have a license to, to those databases. So limiting the, the API to only uh, authorized users limits the number of users. The problem with API from a number of researchers perspective is it also is because the API will limit the body of works that can be um, accessed and mined. And so it's predetermination by the publisher to what researchers can use to mine. So see, this is a set that I'm giving you, you can mine this. But what if I want to use that and not this? So if the API only gives you access to this, you won't be able to mine that. And that's the problem with APIs. It predetermines what you can mine and how you can mine. And if you're only allowed to text mine using that API and nothing else, and you saw in the um, licensing conditions that I showed you at the beginning, you many times you are not allowed to uh, connect the, the database or the data set to other software. So if you develop your own mining software, because you know exactly how and why and how you you want to mine something and um, it's different from the API that they offer you, then you would be uh, breaching the contract and you would be infringing on the copyright. So APIs is, is better than nothing, but it's, it's not ideal, I've been told. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Lucy. And Colin does have a follow up question. Uh, so he says, thank you, Lucy. Your previous answer was very helpful. Following up on a related question, 
I wonder whether you think there are substantial differences between the USA and Canada with respect to the legality of data mining for research purposes. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you. Yes. Well, first, I would say that fair, fair use in the United States is broader than the fair dealing here because um, the fair dealing, oh, so sorry, fair use defense in the United States is not limited to specific purposes. So uh, although our Supreme Court is rather generous in its interpretation of the purposes that are listed in the act, uh, they're still limited to, to those specific purposes. So that's one difference. Uh, and it probably is the main difference. Um, but another difference is that in the United States, at least with the Hattie Trust case and the Authors Guild versus Google case, they do have at least one precedent that uh, touches on text data mining. So remember when uh, the Hattie Trust digitized all the millions of books from different universities collections, uh, the Authors Guild uh, were certainly not happy with that and they sued and in the judge's decision one of the reasons to accept the digitization of the Hattie Trust collection as fair use was because it, it allowed text mining to take place. So it it's not a full-fledged uh, green light to any type of text mining in the United States, but at least it's a step further than than in Canada because we don't have any case law on fair dealing um, uh, in the context of text mining. So the analysis, the fair dealing that I, analysis that I gave you is still speculative. I'm not entirely sure that any type of text mining would pass all the six factors of the um, the fair dealing analysis in Canada. So there might be a, a step further in the United States than we are here in Canada. Back to you, Sandra. Thanks, Lucy. And uh, I think this will be our last question. So of course, I'm going to reserve the right to ask the last question. Uh, I guess it's, it's sort of two parts. Um, why do you think Canada has not uh, moved forward with uh, an exemption? Um, and if, you know, what would you recommend? Sort of you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the European Commission, the UK, uh, Japan, there are places where this has been done. Uh, and, and how would you like to see uh, Canada uh, making an exemption? Yes, thank you. Um... Yes, a uh, very interesting question. Why has Canada not uh, uh, adopted an exception yet? Well, copyright review and copyright reform in Canada is always a, a, a very sensitive topic. Uh, it's very polarized. The interests of publishers or rights owners uh, are, you know, very diametrically opposed to the interests of users and forging ahead with the copyright reform is it proves always very difficult. So there has been a review that has taken place. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't led yet to um, to tangible reform. Uh, hopefully, you know, we, we went through elections, two elections, and it, it's of course not at the top of the list of the government right now. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, there are certainly strong arguments in favor of adopting an exception in the Copyright Act. I think that the um, the fact that the Supreme Court has in the past declared exceptions to be users rights uh, is one thing in that would help. Uh, another thing is, you know, that the government, uh, at least in other branches of the government, does recognize the important research um, and uh, innovation. So the art is always, like always in copyright, to reach the balance and to to listen to all sides of uh, and all stakeholders. Um, I do think 
that in exception for text mining would fit, as I, as I mentioned before, in, in the framework of the Copyright Act. My preference <laughs> would be not to follow the European example, because I think it's too limitative. It restricts the types of research and uh, the institutions that may carry research uh, on the basis of that exception. My inclination, if we were free, <laughs> would be to follow the Japanese example, uh, which was the first country that recognized text mining in its Copyright Act, is that any informational analysis would be uh, available, uh, whether commercial or not commercial. So I, I'm in favor of a broad exception to allow text mining to take place because text mining is a tool uh, and the strongest argument, in my opinion, is that it does not affect the, the interests of the copyright owners. You know, mining things do not affect uh, the, the sale of articles, does not affect the sale of novels, does not affect it in any way the uh, exploitation of those works. So let's you know see where public interest lies and in my opinion the public interest lies in, in uh, promoting research i hope i've i addressed both sides of your question you certainly have that's uh, and let's let's hope uh, you know people from uh, uh, the government are listening so uh, you know i think this is a great example uh, where, you know, the applications and the technology have moved ahead of society and we have to, uh, and our legal system, and we have to readdress this. Uh, so on behalf of Sim, thank you very much. In our physical uh, lectures, I would uh, give you a token to say thanks, uh, but we will be mailing that to you instead. Oh, thank you. Um, and I would like to invite everyone uh, to, uh, Follow along on our website for the details of our next uh, lecture. Uh, we do know it will be on Friday, April 1st um, from 10 to 11, uh, and it will be given by Dr. Jamila Gadar. And uh, we look forward to hearing more details about uh, what she will be uh, talking to us about. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, as uh, was mentioned in the chat, if your questions uh, were not answered, please feel free to send them to sim at dal.ca and uh, we can forward them uh, for you. So again, thank you. This was just a, a wonderful chance to dive into this. Uh, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Good night. Good night, all.